Welcome to Genre Exposure, a film podcast. Join us as we explore the wide world of cinema, broadening our horizons one movie at a time. Uh, as usual, I'm one of your hosts, Dustin, and I'm here with Michael. Hey, guys. And Jason. Hey, what's going on? What's up, guys? How you doing? Pretty good, man. Doing good, doing Dustin. About yourself. Pretty good. Excellent. Have you watched any fun movies? Anything fun to talk about? I have. I have. Who would like to start us off? Not me. Dustin, why don't you start us off? <laughs> Yikes. Why are we even doing this podcast? <laughs> like, I don't really want to talk about movies anymore. <laughs> Well, no, I've got a, I'm happy about mine, but I just don't want to go first. I've got a good one and a a mediocre one. Okay. Oh, two. I'm cheating. Two for. I'm doing it. So two. I've still been on that J horror kick. Of course. I chain off all the uh, pink film watching. <laughs> I've been trying to cleanse my palate still. <laughs> so uh, I decided to check out Hell Girl, directed by Koji Shiraishi from 2019. Oh, live action or? Uh, uh, it's a live action okay. adaptation of an anime. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, the premise of Hell Girl is really simple. It's had like three or four seasons. It's pretty long running, but uh, it generally it's like an anthology kind of show, and someone will be bullied or offended by someone else somehow. And there's this website you can go to, and contact Hell Girl, and you can make a contract with her such that she will punish the person and send them to hell for what they've done. Whoa. But in exchange, whenever you die, you will also go to hell. Nice. That sounds pretty cool. And so every episode is kind of, you know, someone's been wronged somehow. They discover the website. They summon Hell Girl. And it gets into the drama of, like, was it worth it to do that? Mm. It's a little heavier than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's, it's very grim, very serious. And the movie is just sort of like an episode blown up and done live action. Is she red? Is she red? Mm-hmm. Like, 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 a, like, like her brother, Hellboy? Oh. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh. Um, the the actual <laughs> Hell Girl character is played by Tina Tomashiro. She's a newer actress. Um, she was in Sadako versus Kayako, the Room vs. the Grudge movie. <laughs> she was very good in it, even though that film's kind of kind of sloppy. But um, it also had a Kaji Maro, who's a guy I really like. He's in some of uh, Sono's films. Hmm. You would oh. know him, Jason. He's the ball detective in Suicide Club. Oh yeah, he's fun. Like yeah, him. he's a good actor. Yeah. That's uh, how many minutes are we in? Like three minutes in, and you get to take a <laughs> shot. <laughs> um, but I like Shiraishi. He's a good director. He's done like Noroi the Curse. He's done a bunch of found footage oh, things. Oh, that guy. Okay. Uh, a cult Shirome. Um, he's a really fun director. So he was a good fit for this, I think. So is it a good movie? Should we watch it? I enjoyed it. Yeah. And if you don't know the show at all, it's a good come in like introduction because they really go over and kind of lay the groundwork of everything. So you cool. could approach it as a newcomer and be just fine. Nice. Where'd you get it? Or did you have the blue? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't actually have a release right now yet. So well, how are we supposed oh. to watch it? Mm. So I probably shouldn't have mentioned that. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I have my means to watch things. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But did, listen, did you send a message to Hill Girl and she sent you the movie? I would have if I had needed to. <laughs> Are you going to yes. go to hell? For, is it worth it to go to hell for that? <laughs> if hands burst up during recording and take me, you'll know. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, but if this gets any kind of Western release, I don't know if it'll be streaming or home media or what. I was hoping maybe since it's based on an anime, some of the anime companies over here tend to license that stuff for release. Mm, yeah. And it's still pretty new, so maybe there's a chance, but it's definitely one worth seeking out when it gets out there. Cool. That's something I miss about the early 2000s. Anything Japanese was getting released. Yes, yeah, just automatically they someone, you know, Tartan Asian Extreme, Tokyo right. Shock. I miss all that. It was great. Yeah. What happened? Did they just go the fad faded? Okay, mm -hmm. they just went to font. They stopped doing the Japanese remakes, so then they're like, "Well, why should we release these Japanese films?" cuz And I fads hate it, over. dude. It's you got to struggle to find stuff now. Yeah. It's bull crap. We should just get a friend in Japan. I wish. Well, and then, like, hey, can you send us stuff? If any of you are listening in Japan, be our friend. <laughs> Write us. <laughs> Genreexposure at gmail.com. Hit us on the socials. Send us movies. Tell us stuff to watch. Yeah, that'd be Please. great. That'd be awesome. Jason. Yes. What did you watch? Okay. One of my favorite directors is Stuart Gordon. Yeah. Love him. And this is one I just did not watch in the day, and I don't know why. Uh, Robot Jocks. Oh my god, oh, I love Robot Jocks. 1989. Yes. Have you ever seen it, Michael? Um, no. Is it similar to the um, oh, Matheson story? No, you're thinking no. of uh, like Real Steel. Yeah. That's okay. What you're thinking I didn't of. know if it was like a previous version of that or something. No, it is not. Although I can see why you would think so because of the name. Well, I like robots. I don't like jocks, it's, but I like <laughs> robots. It's big stompy robots. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It's basically it's set in the future. And a uh, war is outlawed, but um, countries 
decide who owns what territory through matches with giant robots. I, I could totally get behind this. Yeah, and yes. of course it's low budget. It's a freaking Charles Band movie, you know. <laughs> uh, so the budget couldn't pay for catering for, you know, a James Cameron movie. Um, <laughs> but it's got a lot of heart and a lot of ingenuity, some great stop motion effects. I was going to ask, Hell how yeah. did they do the effects? Was it yeah. stop motion? And the plot's actually pretty decent. It's... Uh, Jeffrey Combs has a minor cameo. I wish he had a bigger role. That's the only problem with it. But the star um, is Gary Graham. And he's done a few things. I mean, if there's any other Star Trek nerds out there, you will know him as uh, the Ambassador Sovel from Enterprise. Nice. He's pretty memorable in that one. That's the one I haven't watched. Oh, you should watch Enterprise. It's, it's I fun. Mean, it, it, yeah, it, it's good. I mean, there's it's, a, it's Star Trek. There's always... It's the intro, man. Oh, <laughs> the intro gets me. The intro sucks. Just we're mute it. We're going to space! <laughs> yeah, we're going to space! I'm pretty sure you can skip that intro if you're streaming it. Yeah, so. That's not their <laughs> finest choice, but it is a good show. <laughs> yeah. We're going it's, to space! <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Robot Jocks is great. I recommend it if you didn't see it, or if it's been a while, check it out again. It's streaming on Amazon Prime right now. Nice. And yes, Michael, it's free. <laughs> Thank you. Prime. Thank you for finally. Look, how many episodes are we in now? Um, seven. Six seven. seven. Yeah, six Thank seven. you for finally telling me if it's if I have to pay money for it outside of the money I've already <laughs> given. Outside to of the initial investment, no. It's important. I need to know. So there's actually another film, and I don't know if it's actually a true sequel or more just inspired by, but it's called Robot Wars. Yeah, I think that's kind of an inspired by that and Crash and Burn. Yeah, and Robot Wars I know has a cool like scorpion mech. Yeah, it's really awesome. Looking. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 good. It's it's worth watching. I Definitely. would watch that. I love Stuart Gordon. Yeah, Stuart oh, Gordon's awesome. He's great. Yeah, one of the best. So Michael, my that, turn. That brings us to you. Yes, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to do two. All right. Sure. I'm going to start with one that was a little surprising that I wasn't fully expecting um, to be as good as it was. So this was one that for some reason <laughs> I got targeted on a Facebook ad <laughs> about this movie. <laughs> I don't know, man. My algorithm's all messed up and. I, <laughs> I get targeted on everything. Um, but this was a 2020 movie that came out directed by uh, Jaron Louder, and it's called Stay Out of the Fucking Attic. Okay. Mm. Um, this it, is on Shudder, right? It's Shudder. Yeah, yeah Shudder exclusive. I think they're the ones who picked up the streaming rights. Uh, story revolves around these ex-cons who are now trying to clean up their lives and are um, running a moving company. And they get a job to uh, move this guy out of an old house. Uh, he's a kind of a creepy old German guy, and he want, tells them that he'll give them three times their going rate plus another thousand dollars if they will work through the night and move everything out the same night. That's wow. your first red flag right there. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that kind of plays into the movie. You know, they're like, "I'm not comfortable with this." Well, it turns out that the dude is a Nazi um, survivor and Yikes. running. Uh, I hate when that happens. <laughs> run, I know. In today's day, day and age, it's more. <laughs> it's a little more common to run into. Um, but yeah, there's. Um, it's pretty low budget. It's. I, I this probably wouldn't win any awards, um, but the acting is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, the characters actually have charisma. I really like to watch them on screen. Hmm. Um, the acting is pretty good. The special effects are fun. Um, there's kind of some cool monsters that are made there. Some kind of cheap tricks that are done through the camera. So does it kind of go supernatural as it gets into it, or a little bit? Yes, yes, but n never outside of that kind of whole Wolfenstein type thing okay. of like. I can dig that. It's never like oh, we're bringing in spirits or anything. It's mm. more just like let's push the boundaries of science and right, right. do horrible things to people to try to figure out what we can do. Um, that's actually pretty good. So mm. I would recommend it. It's short, too. I think it's like an hour and a half or something like that. So not a whole a, a lot of... A normal standard movie length. It's, yes. It's not two hours and 20 minutes. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> fine. But if this movie were two hours and, and 20 minutes, I would be like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. We really need to wrap... I know you didn't have the budget for this much film, so we need to wrap this up. <laughs> but yeah, it's worth checking out. Um, my okay. second one that's kind of mediocre, and I was really bummed that this was kind of mediocre, and maybe you'll disagree with me. Um, but I watched Train to Busan... Uh, Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Well, I haven't seen Peninsula yet. Me either. Okay. So I'm going to be light on spoilers on this one. Yeah, okay. It's super new, right? It just came out. Yeah, literally, I think this week or mm -hmm. something, I just happened to be flipping through Shutter and saw it came out, and I was like, oh, cool. I've been wanting to watch this. Um, this was slated for a big release um, in 2020, 
but didn't happen. This was supposed to be kind of like the big, let's bring the Train to Busan stuff to the States Mm -hmm. and make this a wider Hollywood release. Well, they gave it the budget for that, Hmm. for sure. Um, This movie feels like Land of the Dead. I like like Land of the Dead. I do, too. (laughs) I like like aspects of that. I like most of Land of the Dead. Jason, didn't you ever want to know what it was like to be one of them? (laughs) (laughs) No. (laughs) I... I like Land of the Dead, um, but this was very, very much not the Train to Busan. Mm-hmm. Train to Busan, I felt, had a whole lot of heart, a lot of... Um, it's very focused on the characters and kind yeah. of the drama. And this tried to be, but also shoving in a lot more action. Mm-hmm. So it's the, like Land of the Dead, they go big with it. Exactly. They do go very big. Mm-hmm. Now, they probably for budgetary reasons and set reasons, they do a lot of CG, mm-hmm. but... I will say this, man, whoever they got to play some of the, I'm not going to call them zombies. They're infected. They're not zombies to me. Right. But whoever they got to do them did some amazing contortionist work. Like Like, that's one of, like for real. Yeah, I think so. Like these did not look done post or with wires. These looked like almost like they got break dancers Hmm. to do some of this crazy, like leg bending shit to like, you know, when they become infected, their, like, legs will bend and they will pop up. Yeah. And it looks real enough that right. I don't think – it. that looks very much like something someone could do if they knew what they were doing, like an acrobatics person or something like that. That's cool. So those totally. are super cool. The makeup's always awesome in those. But overall, I'm going to say it was just kind of on the mediocre level. That's too bad. I'm not upset that I watched it at all, and I think you should check it out if you liked Train to Busan because there's a lot to like in this movie. Aren't they still trying to do a remake of Train to Busan, an American version? I hope not. I thought I read that somewhere. I had read that as well, too. But, <sighs> yeah. Just give it a theatrical lease here. I mean... Yeah, it's okay. People can read. It's not <laughs> It's not that hard. But this, uh, you do not have to see Train to Busan to see this. Mm. It's not connected. So same universe, but no connection. Yeah, this is basically set like four years after the... Um, kind of like Dawn of the Dead with Light yeah. of the Living Dead. Yeah, like it's... You don't have to see the first one. I recommend that you do. Um, but it's not... It, the only thing really is just that it's set in that universe. Hmm. Cool. So well, too bad yeah, it like wasn't the better. Korea's been on a little renaissance of like zombie films. Yeah, and some of them are pretty cool. I really want to check out the one. I think it's like hashtag alive. I haven't seen that. It's one. sort of a found footage one. I think it's on Netflix, and I it's like a right, yeah. it's like a guy who's like a YouTube like gaming streamer person, and during one of his live streams, a zombie outbreak starts, and he gets kind of trapped in his apartment complex. Well, that's a fun setting. Yeah. That's Sounds a fun neat. device. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. I could see that happening. Okay, cool. All right, well, should we get into it? I guess so. Let's do it. All right. Well, this is my week. Sure is. And what are we talking about? So I went for 2016, A Dark Song. So this was a movie that uh, Jason recommended to me probably like, um, what did you say, like two years ago? Two or three years ago. Mm-hmm. And I, it was streaming on Netflix at the time. Right. You had seen it. Um, and so I know of your renowned cheapness. <laughs> <laughs> we were literally just talking about this before we started the podcast. <laughs> that I was going to rent a movie online, and it was like six ninety nine. I was like six ninety nine. <laughs> Come on, I'm not going to invest that much money in so this. So did you just like start sweating when Disney rolled out like the twenty dollar movie rentals? <laughs> Well, the only one I've seen is actually Mulan, and Jason and his wife rented it, and I came over and watched it, so I didn't have to pay for it. Uh-huh. But as much as I want to see Raya, uh, their new one, mm-hmm. I, I'm just going to wait till June. I already paid Disney yeah, Plus. Wait like a wait, month or two. I'm going to wait till June. It's not that big a deal. Right. Uh, yeah, anyway, back on track. Um, Jason recommended this movie to me. He knows, and like if you've listened to our introductory episode, you know that I really like um, kind of... A24 studio type films that tend to be slow burns, dark, um, kind of emotional Mm -hmm. hurting type movies. Yeah, people are calling them like art house horror, elevated horror. You called it elevated horror, right? People online call it that. You told me before we started this that you had a better definition (laughs) of elevated horror. Yeah, because we've talked about this before, so I thought like real quick we should go over that. Um, This is kind of the definition that people attach to that. And it's horror movies that don't rely heavily on jump scares or gore but are so emotionally or psychologically disturbing that they traumatize even the most seasoned horror buffs. Many such films also tend to contain some kind of allegorical meaning to their plot. 
Okay, well, that's pretty much you just described a dark song. Yeah. But yeah. you're all, you're also describing a well written movie. Yeah. Right? Period. Um, that's what well written movies do. They have subtext. That they they have meaning. Yes. You know. And it really this kind of kicked off as a thing I think with like Hereditary and The Witch, mm-hmm. and it's almost like a polarizing thing. There's people that really love them. There's people that really hate them. So even saying like that idea of like elevated horror, it's like a double edged thing to that. Where it's like for some people that's like yes, it's elevated. But then to other people, it's like, oh, you know, snooty, <laughs> elevated horror. And that term almost frustrates me because I don't view that – I don't view these movies as elevated at all. No. I think they're good, and I think they fit in their genre. They're doing the same thing that any other horror film does. They're just taking a different path to get there, I think. Exactly, yeah. I mean, everyone has a space for your slasher. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone has a space for a zombie movie. and. If you're trying to tell me that Dawn of the Dead doesn't, like, do some crazy commentary oh, on yeah. social things, they just do it in a different way. Absolutely. So, yeah, A Dark Song. So it is directed by Liam Gavin. Um, I think this is Gavin's first big thing yes. that he'd ever done. He's done some, like, short films, too. Yeah, some short films. This is his first feature. Uh, so our basic premise of the film is that our main character, and I'm God, I'm so bad at names. Um, our main character, Sophia. Played uh, by Catherine Walker. All we know about her character is that her son has died. Somehow. Uh, we don't know how yet. Um, her son has died, and she has found um, a person who is Joseph Solomon, played by Steve Oram, who can apparently perform these magic rituals with her that would allow her to speak to her guardian angel and when once you speak to your guardian angel you can ask them one favor and these are supposed to be extremely grueling we don't know yet the the extent of the rituals but these are supposed to be extremely grueling rituals that are going to put you through mental physical emotional anguish and you just hope it works you mm-hmm. don't have a guarantee. Right. Um, so we know that she's going to give this man lots and lots of money. Um, she has already secured uh, the house that they need to do this in. Because and from the start of the film, out of the gate, she believes in this wholeheartedly. Oh, absolutely. That's something that struck me right away. Yeah, right. She she is, she's obviously a practitioner of some degree of, I, of magic. I don't That's know. The impression I, I, got. I think it's in her grief she's kind of descended into this. That's world. what I think. think. Is that your impression? That's mm-hmm. what I think. I, okay. I well, want to think that she's a practitioner of some sort, but I also think that grief can, when you're struggling so much with something, that you just can't, for whatever reason, you can't break through. You're just to the point where you're like, I'll do anything. That's the classic, like, Faustian bargain. Yeah. I will do absolutely anything to get this. Okay. I see that interpretation. I mean, you were wrong, so it's fine. I'm glad that you... <laughs> well, what, what, how did you take it, Jason? Wow. Uh, what did you think? Like, what was your impression at the start? Um, that she had some knowledge. Whether or not it was... Is it okay to skip ahead a little? Yeah, we can. Because yeah. okay. we can come back around. Well, eventually you find out that her son was murdered right. by a cultist performing a ritual. Right. Mm-hmm. I have a lot I, of thoughts about that, too, but we'll... My we'll impression was later. that she she was herself a practitioner. Maybe these were people that she knew... And, you know, they took her son and, and did their ritual with him. And then she's wanting to summon her guardian angel for this reason. I, I, I got the impression she was already a practitioner. Okay. Hmm. I can see that. Oh, well. But also the, the idea that grief drove her to this extreme is also interesting. You're less wrong now than you were before. But so. how, would, how would she know it was part of a ritual? I mean, I guess perhaps if they found like his body and some amongst arcane writing and things like that, maybe okay. I obviously. feel that that was probably something that was once they once the police found the body and everything. That's probably something that the police jumped to, mm-hmm. you know, to try to describe. But we don't get that in the I, film. I like that we don't get that. Yeah, absolutely. A very minimal backstory. We don't know that at all until almost halfway through the film, right? Um, because the reason that she tells. Um, him that she wants to do this ritual is that she says um, she loves someone that doesn't love her back, I think, Mm -hmm. is what she said. Which she doesn't think is a good enough reason. No, no, no. (laughs) Um, And some contextual stuff for that, too. He is like her last line of trying to get this thing to happen. She's contacted several other people, and they've already turned her away. Right. It seems like she's worked through kind of the the normal type of people that you'd find in mm-hmm. the the magic, the occult. Yeah, yeah the occult underworld, as it yeah. were. And this guy, Joseph Solomon, he's kind of a schlub. Mm-hmm. You know, um, 
Liam Gavin talked about him in casting that he really wanted him for this role. And he said that his idea is he said, and I don't think we get this so much as American audience, but he said he really wanted a train spotter. Mm. Like that's what he wanted. He wanted this guy (laughs) that just felt like your average dude that you could walk into a pub anywhere in England. And this guy'd be sitting there. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, he's when we first see him, he's in like a track suit, (laughs) you know, and (laughs) he's not dashing. He's not handsome. And that was apparently, um, not what the studio wanted at well, all. Of course they wouldn't. <laughs> they wanted somebody to be like a Jason Momoa type. Yeah, what? <laughs> I know. No. Like uh they that's what they really wanted. And he's like, No, 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 this doesn't Yeah. We don't need a spiritual warrior here. We need a guy that Jason Momoa doesn't need sorcery. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you just get an axe out. Yeah. Dude's yeah. always got an axe for some reason. Uh, so yeah, that's where we start off. She meets uh Solomon and Basically is telling him she's secured the house. She has his money. She's willing to do this ritual. And he tells her, you know what's going to happen. Like mm-hmm. You know this is going to be bad. They literally take off to go start looking for the house. And he starts asking her about, you know, why she's doing it. And that's when she says, I've, I, I love someone that doesn't love me back. And he's like, fucking take me back. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. this isn't reason enough to go through this. Right. What you, you have no idea what you're about to go through. Yeah. Cause what he says, what matters is her intentions, what she's right. wanting to get out of it, which I think, which you'll probably talk about in a little while, but that's one of the key elements to, um, like magic, mysticism, mm. yes. spiritualism is your intent. Mm-hmm. What is your intention for doing something? Cause if you have the wrong intention, you're not going to get the right results. results. Yeah. So he knows what he's going to have to do physically, spiritually and emotionally to do this for her. But he's also going to get a favor as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but then she kind of has to open up a little bit more and say, you know, I forget what she tells him, like her next reason. Uh, it, she does bring up the son, right? I think. And she says that right. she wants uh, vengeance. vengeance. Or yeah, she wants vengeance. But we still don't know that this is a group of occultists. Yeah, we just know that her son was killed and she wants vengeance on the killer. And she didn't want to say that because that seems like a selfish desire right but once she openly admits it joseph solomon has no problem with that Mm. he's like okay well at least you're being honest because that's what it's going to take to do this Mm. so i love the way that he uh, steve oren plays him too it's like because he's quizzing her on what kind of rituals she's already observed and 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 read about yes it's almost like a job interview or something right and it's also like uh like an alpha nerd (laughs) <laughs> who, oh, very much so. Yeah, yeah. Who yeah. wants yeah. to know your credentials? Like he's the type of guy that wouldn't speak to you if you couldn't name every actor who played Doctor Who yeah. in chronological order. Right, you're right. not worthy to be in his company if you don't know this. <laughs> he things. really comes off as a total asshole yeah, for oh, this yeah. entire oh, yeah. film, and he's supposed to. Um, I think there's. I I don't think that's true. I don't think he is a total asshole, and we'll get into that as we go. But but yeah, he's. I mean, yeah, yeah. this is not yeah. a dude. Even watching him eat pissed me off. <laughs> you know, they go to a diner or a pub or something like right before they go to the house to start really yeah. preparing for the ritual. And it's just the way he eats. He's eating French fries with a fork and a knife <laughs> and chips. They're chips over there. Yeah. Well, okay. Chips. He's eating <laughs> chips, which we're in Ireland, right? I believe the film set in Ireland. It's the actual house. It's, I think it's in Wales. It's yeah, it's in Wales, but be. yeah, I, it feels no, that she does mention Wales. I think she mm-hmm. does say something about it being in Wales. Yeah. But it feels like any typical um, United Kingdom countryside. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's very remote, so it feels like it could be that. Uh, but, yeah, even watching this dude eat really frustrates me. It's a very arrogant eating, yes, <laughs> if yes. that's possible, like to eat something <laughs> arrogantly. Um, but he always gives this air of, I know what I'm doing. You're at my mercy. And if you want to do this, you're going to do absolutely everything I say, when I say it, how I say it. And you're Mm -hmm. going to keep your mouth shut about it. So as we go along, they finally make it to the house. Their opening scene of the film is um, she's walking through the house asking, like, which direction does this house face? Or which Mm -hmm. direction does this room face? Because even the location and the layout matters. Right, exactly. Everything is extremely detail-oriented. Um, she, we know something's going to go down because she basically tells the guy, the realtor that's, uh, renting her the house that, you know, she gives him like a stack of cash just to keep 
the paperwork out of it, yeah. you know? Yeah. She's like, well, I'm going to need it for a whole year. Here's all of the money for the year, and then here's <laughs> extra money so that you don't tell anybody that I'm here. Mm-hmm. So that's already how we're setting up the film. Um, I think some interesting things to talk about as we first start, though, is how this film is shot. Mm-hmm. We get a lot of these really beautiful but haunting um, rolling countryside shots. I loved all the wide countryside shots. You see the clouds yes. rolling through. They look very separated. They almost look hyper-realistic, you know, or like almost surrealistic, I guess is probably the proper mm-hmm. word, mm-hmm. of these shots. And I think that really sets the tone. Yeah, it's very painterly type compositions. Yeah, I mean, everything feels already like you are a little bit otherworldly. Yes, yes. And, you know, a testament to how good this film looks, it was apparently only shot in 20 days. Oh, yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, I mean, that's pretty impressive. I, I But everything I've seen of Wales is beautiful anyway, so it's probably not hard. You just, like, kind of point the camera <laughs> and you're like, oh, this is really beautiful. It's just it's easy work. But the, the way that the tone is being set up for the film, just with these opening shots, already tells you, like, okay... This is kind of dark. Yeah, because he tells her, like, if you want to get out now, go for a walk. Because once we start the ceremony, the house has to be sealed. Mm-hmm. And you're not leaving. Yeah, and this you is can't going, leave. This is going to take months to perform this ritual. He even tells her, like, right before um, she's going into town to get supplies. Mm-hmm. He gives her a list. And uh, he even says, like, you need to get enough for eight months. And you're like, holy shit, you're going to be locked in this house for eight months. And I love how long they spend, like, setting up and prepping the house and showing it to you. Because it almost makes it like it is another character in this film. Absolutely, yeah. I really felt that, too. That you... Because this film doesn't have a lot of characters right. in it. Right. It's just the two of them in the house for most of it. It's basically a play. Which yeah. Which is awesome. We get a couple side characters here and there that relate to our main characters. But, yeah, for the most part, this is a two-person film. But there is a significant thing that does happen when she goes to get the supplies. Right. She right. runs into her sister. Mm-hmm. Which is super weird because, I mean, I get why they do this. Her and her sister's interaction are so disjointed mm-hmm. that you don't realize it's her sister. You know, like until she says something that tells you that she's her sister. But I think it's because who Sophia is now isn't who is not who she was. It's like she stepped into a different world. Mm -hmm. She's after the grief and the loss that she's experienced. It's changed her. Like she's not Sophia anymore. And you get some neat tidbits there. You learn that for some time she was being like treated for mental health. Right. Right. Which are seem to be which are very important to what is going to happen Mm -hmm. to her that she may not be as mentally stable Mm -hmm. and it's a good seed that they set up that way and you just kind of get it in passing but you don't learn the extent of what she was going through what kind of treatment it was any of that yeah they just like plant that seed in your mind going forward and i think it's very easy for um people to relate to sophia i think she's a very relatable character because i think most all of us have experienced some form of grief Mm -hmm. that's we all work through in our own ways, whatever that is. Some may be more healthy than others. But I think that the point of this movie is to tell you that it doesn't really matter how you work <laughs> through your grief as long as you as long as long you get what you need from it. Mm-hmm. Um, which, any, which step of the grieving process is turning to black magic? Uh, that's is like it? step two. Oh, wow. For, for me. Oh, for okay, me, okay. yes. Uh, that's I, the uh, bargaining portion, right? <laughs> yeah. I go with the initial loss and then I'm straight up like, you know, throwing blood on a floor and <laughs> <laughs> I'm scribing runes in the floor. That's wow. where I go right after that. That's but extreme. yeah, man, like everyone's had something where it's like, they, at least for a time you think hey, I would give anything to change this and make right. a difference somehow. Or, so that's easy, easy, relatable inroad. One of my big ones in life is I would give anything to talk to that person again, mm-hmm. you know, like just to say something, mm-hmm. you know, and you sometimes have to ask yourself if the possibility were there for you, that you truly believed that you could, but it was going to cost you something to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, would you try? And I think that's kind of what this movie is really setting up Mm -hmm. is how far would you go? Yeah. And how important is this to you? And I can't imagine losing a child. Yeah. You know, like how far would I go to heal that? And you realize pretty quickly how far she does have to go once they start the ritual because it is long. It is involved. And you know what? Let me correct us because I just had a revelation in my mind as we're talking through this. Isn't it at first she wants to speak to her son? Isn't that the first part? And then later it becomes the revenge thing. Yes. Yes. Because something happens with the ritual that Mm -hmm. he claims that it's her fault. Yep. 
So and tellingly, she doesn't want to perform the um, forgiveness ritual right, portion right. of the ceremony. Exactly, which means she has to go through these even more excruciating trials and ordeals to, to perform the ceremony. Right. So right. as as they get to the house and they do all the preparations for the house and they seal it with salt. Like the entire house is yep. surrounded by salt. Your classic ring of salt. Yep. For an unbroken line. Once the door is shut, the house is sealed. And you can't go back through that door. And he makes it, Solomon makes it very clear that if you go through this door, horrible things will happen. Um, and he said that we're basically sealing off the house and leaving this plane of existence. Mm-hmm. Is what he tells her. And I think as a viewer, you're already like, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> like this dude's just a charlatan. You know, he's taking her money and he's going to exploit her and and he's going to do all these things. But as he starts prepping her for what she's going to need to do mentally and physically, he's got books and books and books of mm-hmm. handwritten notes that he has meticulously scribed to do this ritual. And he reminds her that every single action has a reaction. And then if you don't do it exactly perfect, this will not work. Mm-hmm. So he's already setting her up for failure, actually. And we learned, too, what? He's done it three times, I think he says. Right. Twice it's failed, one time it's worked. Right. And he doesn't give you a lot of information on what he got from yep. the first one. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> or what happened with the other two other than they just failed. And it's probably a good time to mention that how this movie represents... It's a great representation of ritual or, or ceremonial magic. Yes. It's something I wanted to talk about a little bit. Yeah. Um... Well, that's a real. I think that's a really good segue that we can start talking sure. about what the rituals are. Yeah, mm-hmm. let's go into it. Um, so, one of the opening things that he talks about, and I don't know much about this at all. Like, I know this is probably big in the spiritual world, in mm-hmm. the realm of like magic with a K and occultism. Um, but there are these different planes of existence that have been drawn out on the floor, right? And that you're going to break through all of these planes at some point through the ritual, but Mm -hmm. it might involve you sitting in this one circle for days. Yeah. A lot of it is magic squares where you kind of like make a spot and there's a certain like phrase or word that you've created on it to represent something. Yeah. And then by like meditating and focusing there, you're like channeling through that. It's a very Kabbalistic diagram on Mm -hmm. the floor that she's sitting in. I I think this movie really appealed to me too, because I don't know a whole lot about that. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm super into horror and, but I grew up very Judeo Christian, so this is very oh, this is taboo for the way I grew up. You know, <laughs> yeah, like this yeah. is not something you touch. Right, right. Um and and this film kinda hints on that too, that this is something mm-hmm. that's very dark and we're getting ready to do something horribly dark. But this stuff comes from the real grimoires right. from the from the Renaissance age, like fourteen hundreds, fifteen hundreds. And you know, grimoires were the magical books that told you how to do, perform these rituals, and they were insanely complex. Right. And they would give any number of reasons why things wouldn't work. Exactly, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> and the ritual they perform is actually really from a book out there. That you yeah, can the get. book of uh, Bramlin, isn't it? I think it's a Bramlin. A Bramlin, is that I'm not 100% pronounced? sure on that. But the thing they're doing is called the Bramlin Operation. Yeah, which is Warlocks. Feel free to write in and correct us on our pronunciations. <laughs> um, but the book of a Bramlin, it's the story of an Egyptian mage named of Ramlin, who taught a system of magic to Abraham of Worms, who was a Jew that lived there, um, presumed to have lived like 1362 to 1458. Okay. And it was this system of magic that became popular later in time as the book was translated, uh, first by uh, Samuel Little McGregor Mathers. What a name. Yeah, cool, <laughs> cool name. I know what I'm naming my child. Definitely now. a warlock. <laughs> Um, and it got co-opted by the Order of the Golden Dawn, and then later... Like Al- everything else did. Yeah, of course, they grabbed anything they could. And then, of course, <laughs> Aleister Crowley co-opted it for Thelema when he developed that. See, all of this is completely foreign to me, and I fucking love it. <laughs> all right, well, let me walk you through this just a little bit, and we'll dive back into the movie. So, it was an elaborate ritual that's purpose was to obtain knowledge and conversation with the caster's guardian angel. It had elaborate preparations, was very difficult, and long to perform. Uh, The original German translations of it suggested it would be an 18-month process before any divine contact was made. Uh, Later translations suggested it could go as early as six months, but could take longer. Um, During this period of doing the magical work, the magician has to pray before sunrise and again at sunset. And during all the preparations, there's various restrictions which we see some of these in the movies. Uh, 
Chastity must be observed. You have to uh, eschew any alcoholic beverages. I'm out. <laughs> and, and you must conduct all your business and activities in fairness, trying to be absolutely fair to everyone that you interact with. And then after you complete that preparatory phase, you begin through this ritual that will eventually lead to you contacting your guardian angel. Which they've told us that he asks her right before they start everything, have you been, have you abstained from alcohol? Mm-hmm. Have you abstained from sex? Have you, mm-hmm. um, you know, going through exactly what you just said? These are the yes. things. And she's like, yes, I know what I'm, I know what I was supposed to do. And I did all these things. And as someone that's always been interested in like reading and learning about this stuff, their uh, devotion to like the accuracy of representing this in film, it really impressed me. Oh, he, the director definitely did his research. Yeah. So as it goes, once you start to accomplish a lot of this ritual, you eventually have to evoke the 12 kings and duke of, of hell and bind them. That seems dangerous. And thereby you gain command of them and of your own mental universe and can remove any of the negative influence that they exhibit on your life. Okay. Um, I'm slightly confused now, but okay. And then the goal in performing that is that, uh, same as you would see in a lot of grimoires, you get promised different abilities, the uh, ability to find buried treasure, to cast love charms, flight, invisibility, all your... Right, you know, magical BS that you usually told. Right, and these rituals also often invoked God and angels mm-hmm. uh, to protect them from the demons and the dark forces like that. So even though it's it's definitely black magic, it was very Christian in its way. Well, look at the time frame. I mean, like everything is Christian in that time right now. You mm-hmm. know, like and if you're not, <laughs> right? I mean, back, and even yeah. Christianity so. has its like magical leans with stuff like Kabbalah and Gnosticism. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, I think Kabbalah's Jewish, right? Mm-hmm. So we got it. Yeah. Christians don't claim delineate, the juice. Delineate yeah. that Christians correctly. don't claim yeah. the juice. <laughs> so, <laughs> we got to change that one. Um, a last thing to kind of note about this that I thought was interesting. Magical squares feature prominently in the instructions of the operation, as does a recipe for creating an anointing oil, which is based out of a uh, passage from Exodus. And this is still used today by some ceremonial magicians, and it's called a bramlin oil. Huh. There's other tools that you need for the ritual, such as a holy lamp, a wand made of an almond branch, and a recipe for a special kind of incense to burn, different robes that you have to wear, and a square or seven-sided plate of silver or beeswax. God, this is fascinating. And we, spell components for D&D spells? Right? Yeah, it kind of sounds like it. <laughs> okay. But you see a lot of these little elements in the movie. Yeah, like, and that, that changes now the way I'm seeing certain things. Like It's almost the movie lays it out for you like, well, you should know this. But <laughs> obviously, right. but it also tells you the movie also gives you confidence that he knows this, yes. that Joseph Solomon knows this. So we as a viewer don't have to worry about it. We believe him the same way that Sophia believes him. Right. And even Orem's character's name, Solomon, is a reference to the clavicle or key of Solomon. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is one yes. of the most famous grimoires attributed to, to, to King Solomon. Yep. But it's probably written in the 14th or 15th centuries, I think. I think so. Yeah. So we have this background of what they're going to do. And as we start going through it, he's he's in the ceremonial robes. Um, one of my favorite things is that he has to apparently be shaved yes, um, for the entire thing to work. And, and he can't get to his back. So there's some really great awkward scenes of Sophia shaving his back. I love that it keeps his facial hair, though. I wondered about that. Well, I mean, but it makes sense, though, because in the Judeo-Christian world, beards aren't considered so much hair. They're more of like you just have them, you know, like it's part of your status symbol or part of your religion. That you I, I didn't that. consider that angle, but that's a good point that, uh, yeah. or I think in, uh, Eastern Orthodox, mm-hmm. um, beards are crucial, right? You're, like, you're basically not a man until you have a beard, right? Right. I mean, there's two of us sitting here and we have, I have beards. a beard <laughs> and you, you uh, have a beard, I Michael. have a beard. Um, Dustin, Dustin doesn't uh, have a beard. <laughs> Mr. Clean shaven over here. Well, I guess we know who's uh, not leading the ritual. <laughs> And I'm not shaving any of your bats, <laughs> just so you know. Nice. But as these things start to progress, um, we start to see the physical torture that she's going to go through. She's sitting in one of these squares. Um, she's He's just dumping, looks like freezing water on her. Mm-hmm. Right, she can't sleep. Right, she's not constantly being awakened. But that's already start to plant the idea in our minds as the viewer that um, this might not be real. What she see, what she is experiencing, and what she might be feeling is probably just due to, like, tort- sleep deprivation. Yeah, these all look like torture things. Yeah, so that yeah. you would it do to torture, someone, right? 
It's sacrifice. And no, keeps, nothing for nothing. I mean, that's one of the rules of magic, right? Definitely. And he keeps telling her, too, like, you'll see signs eventually. But she, as they go, she just keeps saying, you know, where are the signs? I don't see anything. I don't feel anything. Right. What's going on? And it's, But she does hear a dog bark. Mm-hmm. Um Almost from the very beginning. And Solomon says that is a sign. Yeah, he says that that sign, that is a sign, because they're supposed to be in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to see, like, there are no dogs. But during her hike earlier, she finds a dead dog. She does. That has a collar and everything. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it's very, it's a creepy shot, too. It is. It's a really creepy um, makeup effect. Yeah. But you can feel her doubt, I think, in that moment. Right. Because the way he says it is like, it started. Right. It started. That's a sign. And she's like, no, that's bullshit. It's, it's a dog a barking. Dog barking. Yeah. <laughs> but in this type of magic, everything is a sign. Right. And that's a lot to do with the general idea of any kind of magic, really. There's this idea of, like, magical thinking, which is something I wanted to talk about really quick. Uh, that's generally the belief that in unrelated events, they're somehow casually connected, despite the absence of any sort of plausible link that would make it be so. No, oh, QAnon. That's what you're talking about. Uh, so. Let's not go there, but oh, oh. Um, we see this in like things we can quantify, like the placebo effect. The idea mm-hmm. that I could just give you a pill and, pill and say, like, hey, this is going to make you feel better. And it does, and you believe it to be so, even though it's just like a salt tablet or something. Right. And, and the so, same could easily be said through most modern religions as mm-hmm. well today, that if something good happens, well, God's ordained it. Right. Or if something bad has happened, well, it just wasn't in his plans. Well, humans love to see patterns. Right. You know, it's we, in our, it's actually in our nature. Yeah. Like right, it's in our, them. it's, it's in our nature to do it. We can't stop it. Right. And so for a lot of a cult, I think the underlying part to it is this idea of magical thinking that what you do and the processes, and especially something like this, where it's ritual magic and it's very highly, you know, processed and stylized. The act of doing that is kind of like forcing your brain to work in that pattern. Mm. And if you ascribe to that there's any sort of strength in that, that you could, like, enforce your will upon the world, that's kind of the engine that fuels that. Right. Hmm. One thing I forgot to mention is the right before everything starts, um, Solomon's cutting up mushrooms mm-hmm. um, oh, yeah. as they start. And, uh, and he gives her one, and she's like, that's a toadstool. And he's like... You fucking eat it, or we're done. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, "Is it gonna make me sick?" And he's like, "Oh yeah." And she's like, "Is it gonna be bad?" Oh yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You got to purify yourself. Right. And he's he said she's purified herself spiritually, so now she needs to do it physically. And yeah. she's just puking her guts out, like <laughs> shitting her brains out. I mean, it's a wonder she didn't die from yeah. this mushroom. But already, when I saw it for the first time, it made me think that this whole thing could be a trip. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That everything we're about to see might not be true. And that's one way to explain the whole magical experience that people right. have. Right. Is it hallucinogens? Is it lack of sleep? You know? <laughs> Sometimes it almost feels like the film itself, like the camera is another character in this movie. And everything that the camera is doing for us is almost trying to prove to us that this isn't real. I can you know? see that. Yeah. Like, because it's giving us all of these, and the story is giving us all of these cues so that we are the viewer, we are the camera. Mm-hmm. And everything that we are seeing is we're trying our best to point to the bullshit in the room. Mm-hmm. And with the, I think by giving us that scene with the mushrooms, we're like, ah, yeah, she's just tripping balls. <laughs> right. You know, like all this, that's our way out. That's our way to stop. And I think, too, right out of the gate, as soon as they start, he is so cruel to her with, like, how he treats her, how oh, he yeah. shouts at her. And so it really wants to kind of push this angle that he is, like, a charlatan that is taking advantage of her. Yeah, insanely misogynistic. Mm-hmm. I think my wife was sitting there, and she's like, fuck this guy. Yes, yes. <laughs> Which, that to me also made me think of Aleister Crowley, because no. if you buy into his stuff, I guess that's one thing. But on a lot of levels, he was kind of just a con man that sort of, like, you know talked his way up to people and really like abused a lot of people. A narcissistic jerk mm-hmm. like Solomon. Is. Yeah. <laughs> and I saw that in a lot of the ways that Solomon would like tear her down when he gets weird sexually to her, which is definitely a part we should talk about in a minute. Yeah. That's all like right from the book of Crowley and the stuff he's done in the past. Mm-hmm. Well, and so we can get to that scene. She's already mm-hmm. gone through a lot of these rituals, all, mm-hmm. a lot of the physical torture that she's being put through for this, which interestingly, Joseph Solomon does not have to do. Right. It's only her who wants to invoke it. Exactly. Solomon is very much just helping torture her. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't have to do these parts. Now, he would claim that what he's doing is extremely important. And without him, this ritual can't take place. Right. And he basically tells her that, like, you don't know the ritual. 
you can't do this without me. Mm-hmm. That's what good cult leaders do, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> and so we find that he tells her from the beginning that there will have to be ritual sex. And you're kind of waiting for this because they drop, yeah. they drop it and you're like, okay, well, this is going to come in at some point. Mm-hmm. But it's not at all what we think it's going to be. And it's another level, too, where you wonder about this ritual because we're talking about invoking our guardian angel. And we're talking about the purity that needs to be there and right. like spiritually and physically. And then you're like, well, there's also a ritual sex, though. That's Yeah, it seems very counterintuitive mm-hmm. to what mm-hmm. they're trying to do. But the ritual sex is not what we think. And I think she was prepared to have sex with Joseph Solomon. If, if that's she, what it took. If that's what it took, she was prepared to have sex with him, but that's not what happened. Mm-hmm. It, he ends up basically asking her to put on some makeup, take her clothes off yeah. for him, and he jerks off to right. her. You know, he makes her sit in positions that get him off. Which is probably more humiliating to her than yes. if she actually had to have sex with him. Exactly. Like, yeah, I don't want to assume that, you know, the act of telling someone they have to have sex with you is, you know, those are two hor- still horribly. They, they, they both sound very Yeah, they're both very yes. horrible and should not be done to another human being. But but in a way, this is just another level of humiliation for her. Right. Mm-hmm. Like that she could get, she, you almost feel like she could get through it. Okay, if I have to have sex with this dude to do this, I can do this. But it's more that she didn't have to. Right. It's a very arresting scene to even watch. Yeah, it's really uncomfortable. Um, and he acts like, well, I didn't want to do it. Well, I don't almost, want to have to do it. It almost seems like it was unnecessary, and he was just fucking with her. Right, right. It really does, because she was not really that involved in the ritual sex, mm-hmm. other than just being the item that he is jerking off to. He mm-hmm. says something like it was for his own release. Yeah. Which you think he could have done by himself. <laughs> well, and that that <laughs> scene right there starts the, the split between them. Right, the a, a rift starts to grow. Yeah. Between the two of them. And I mean, she pisses into the breakfast. She does, day. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she makes all the food and she goes to the bathroom, pisses in a cup and then pours it in his food and she's mm-hmm. like, I'm not hungry, you know? <laughs> so already that's, that rift is starting to come between them and she's already starting to not believe it anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think that's our crucial moment there for the film is that yeah. she's starting to question all of this stuff. Well, they go through the whole ritual, nothing happens. He says, we have to do it again. The yeah. whole thing, all that, over Yeah, that's again. where we get into her intent. He says that something's wrong and it's her fault. Yeah. And she's already been through so much that she gets very angry with him. Right. But then that's when we find out, uh, I don't really want to talk to my son. I want revenge. Yeah, and that's when she reveals to him that how her son has died mm-hmm. and she wants revenge. And the interesting thing to me was that Solomon was never not okay with that. Mm-hmm. You know, he was like... That's fine. Yeah, he said good or bad doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It's the intent of what you want. Yeah. Right. I just need your pure intent. And so they start everything over. Yeah. And they they like she she has to drink Solomon's blood as well because mm-hmm. she refuses to go through the forgiveness phase of the ritual. Mm-hmm. Right. Because she does not want to forgive her son's killers. Right. But I think that that's not who she doesn't want to forgive and we find that out I think in the final scene of the film. Mhm. Um, well, before I mean, he 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 literally kills her too during the ritual. Right, he when, drowns yeah, they her. Have to, they then, have to reset her, right? Yeah, uh, spiritually. And then he resuscitates her. It and, looks like she's going to be baptized. Yeah, you know, and that's kind of the way he's setting it up. Which that's the same metaphor, right? You're born again through baptism, right? Exactly. Right. But you know, when it and this was always my fear when I was baptized as a kid <laughs> that they just weren't going to let me up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are putting a lot of trust in someone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, thankfully. They let me up, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> or this is all a simulation. And we're just... <laughs> anyway. He, uh, he's learning the truth. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> I took the red pill. <laughs> so, yeah, but he holds her under. Mm-hmm. And she drowns. She drowns. Yeah. He resuscitates her. She's super pissed off the next day, pushes him. Which, you know, I thought of uh, the Constantine film. Cause yeah. He does that as well in yeah. that film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that was not a good movie. It has moments. It's fun. <laughs> But he pushes. She pushes him. He goes into this knife that's on the counter. Goes through his abdomen, and, and he says, "This is this is this a is sign. a sign. This is good. This is a sign. This is a sign. It's working." And he says, "Your guardian angel is very powerful and very angry." Right. Um, but we know as a viewer, this is bad. Mm-hmm. This is real bad. Yeah, they're locked up in a house. They can't themselves. leave. No real medical. It's not attention. the kind of wound that's treatable. Just and he, with like a med he, kit or something. And he even asked her, "Was the knife clean?" He's like, "I don't know. <laughs> Was the knife clean or dirty?" Um, as if to me, I would have been like, I don't fucking care. It's like through my gut right now, but they can't leave. So he gets her to pull the knife out. 
um, yeah. they he kind of st- they bandages them up, bandages them, and the ritual continues. Mm-hmm. But as from there, we start to see Joseph Solomon really degrading in health. You can tell this is not going well. Though we do get some moments in this section where we start to actually have some signs. We There's do. the gold dust that rains down at the one part. Mm-hmm. Right. She has a little toy that's like her keepsake of her son. Mm-hmm. And it starts to sort of move around the house and show up in different places. Yep. Which culminates in her actually hearing her son's voice. Yes. From Which is, the door. I think, one of the coolest. It's very creepy. Creepy mm-hmm. things. She, and because she hears this knocking, mm-hmm. you know, and this scratching, and she runs down the hallway, and it's just her. You know, yes. this is the middle of the night, and she hears her son. Mm-hmm. Plain as day. It's her son. And he says, I'm your son. And mommy, let me. Let me let me in. Let me yes. in. Open the door. Let right. me. But, in. but she knows better. Important. She knows better. You know, she yes. knows this isn't her son, and she knows not to open the door, not to let him in. And right. She, she says as much. She says, "I know that you're not my son. You're yeah. just using his voice." Right. We also hear a dog growling mm-hmm. now and in this scene, and getting closer. Yeah. And the boy's like, "Mommy, he's in here. It's in here with me. It's a dog in here with me." But all these things, when I was watching this for the first time, and then watching this again with you guys, is it all feels like just straight hallucination. Mm-hmm. Just straight depression, hallucination, like you're literally lost in a state that you don't know what's real and what's not anymore. Yeah. And that your mind is creating what you want to hear, and you're just following it as much as you can. And notably, a lot of the times, like when she hears her son, Solomon's not around. It's just her that's experiencing this. Right, right. So basically, she falls asleep in the hallway mm-hmm. because she doesn't – I think she doesn't want to leave because – it's a connection to her son. Mm-hmm. You know, even if this isn't him, right. it sounds so like voice. him. Yeah. yeah, it's a connection that she can stay there. Um, but this is where shit really starts to start happening. Yeah. Like, things are starting to go off the rails now. Um, oh, Solomon's shit. deteriorating. Yeah, both, uh, I think, mentally and physically. Mm-hmm. He's starting to, to go down. And this is also where we get a little bit more about him, because she asks what he wants as his favor yeah. in the ritual. Yeah, and he says invisibility. Right. But it's not what you think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because they laugh, you know. Yeah. Um, and he says he just wants to live the rest of his life just to not be seen. Mm-hmm. He and, says he's tired of this world that he's been in with people seeking him out and all of the rituals and stuff. And he just wants to just go and be somewhere. He right. Sa- he says to gain some quiet before the howl. Mm-hmm. Which seems to me like he knows he's damned. Or right. thinks he's damned for all these things he's done the incantations who knows what else sure right? you know see this scene really affected me a lot more this time than the second time because when she asks, like why do you do this and the thing that really got me is he's like just a fucking is he said just a fucking no yeah to look behind the veil yeah. knowledge yeah, sure. just to know and that really got me i think because i I actually kind of got cold chills at that part a little bit. Like, it really struck me. Yeah, because I got to thinking to myself, like, of all the questions I have about the universe and, like, why we're here and all that shit, I started to wonder, like, okay, well, if maybe this worked, like, would I do it? Mm -hmm. Just so I can know? That's anyone. Like, if you could know for sure, wouldn't you want to? Yeah, and I think for some people, they're okay to not, Mm -hmm. ever. But somebody like me, I would be like, I don't know. I kind of want to know. Yeah. I think it might. But... You think like, okay, that might set my mind at ease, and I can be at peace if I know, but clearly he's not at peace. <laughs> right. No. And right. I think what he looked at on the other side, I take this as when he says invisibility, I took it as they're always he always sees it. You know, like he's been seen by the other side. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I'm thinking like a quiet before the howl. Mm-hmm. That, and that's that idea too, that if you gaze into the abyss, it gazes back at you. Right. 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 Like this is, he's paid for this. Mm-hmm. And I think from that statement, you can start to see in his character, maybe he really has paid for this mm-hmm. and this, uh, but I do think we get something else a little bit later though, or like pretty soon after this. Well, yeah, he, he dies in his sleep. Right. What he says right before he dies, though, uh, got me, hmm? is that he says, I really miss my sister. And he's crying. Yeah. And he says, I really miss my sister. And I think this was why he got into it. I think something happened to his sister. And I think he's in the exact same place that Sophia was at the beginning. And maybe that's why he even accepted her once she said the truth and it was about her dead son. Right. Because it's just the way he's sobbing. He's no longer... The asshole. No, he's just mm-hmm. a man. A dying he's, man. Yeah, just a dying man. And when he says, I just really miss my sister, that really got me. That it made me think maybe he is, maybe he was 
Sophia might become him. Mm-hmm. You know, that once she goes through this, he was seeking it for the same reasons. Mm-hmm. And maybe what he saw the time that it did work told him that there was no way she was ever going to see him. You know, like, mm-hmm. yeah. It's interesting interpretation. Uh, yeah, I probably. I, like I read a lot into this movie, man. This it's, movie, it's there if you want to go. Sure. Yeah, this or maybe movie, she just moved to France and he hasn't seen her in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he's just an asshole and she's like, <laughs> I can't be around you anymore. We'll never know because he dies. But right after this, right after he says this, though, you know, the scene changes and he's dead. Mm. She goes to wake him up and he's he's gone. And then this is something I had a question about. She 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 finds out that he's dead and he goes she goes to his books and his notes and everything's been crossed out and yeah. scribbled out. Now my question is cuz it, it doesn't really say so, is this something that Solomon did before he died or was this something like the demons may have done? I don't know, that's that a really have, good that question. Here's her. another thought. Hmm? Was it always like that? <laughs> was it always like that? Yeah. Right, yeah. I think that's what we're supposed to think as a viewer though. Mm-hmm. I think we're set up to think because she's panicking now because she knows she can't leave the house. Because he says, you're stuck in this time forever. And like he said, she doesn't know how to continue it. So she's panicking because her guide is now dead. What is she supposed to do? Mm -hmm. And so the books are scratched out. She can't do anything there. Nope. So she tries to leave the house. She does. But the car won't start. Right. Classic horror movie fashion. (laughs) The way it should be. Which I found this funny, though, because literally right before we watched it, one of our gaming friends was like, man, I'm so quarantined. I tried to start my car the other day, and I haven't started it in a year, and just the battery was gone. <laughs> right, yeah. And I was like, well, that's pretty relatable right now. And they have been there for months. So, yeah, the battery just died. Yeah, yeah. it's just yeah. not working anymore. But notably, she was never supposed to cross that line until they completed the ritual. Oh, yeah. And so she walks. She tries to hoof it. Yeah. And she walks and walks and walks. And then she sees the house again. Yep. Because she's... No matter where she goes, she's, yeah, she's coming. stuck there. She's All stuck roads in this next. time. So she goes back in the house. She doesn't have anything else she can do. Mm-hmm. So she goes back in the house, and she sees a big pile of vomit on the floor. And she's like, well, this wasn't here before. This is not my vomit. <laughs> um, and then she sees Solomon laying in the hallway. And she's like, fuck, he was dead, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, he was dead. Maybe. It looks like it. And then this is where shit... I think it's just a, such a super creepy and effective moment. So up to this point, it's been a very slow burn film where it's kind of just the slow process of the ritual and everything that's going on. But I think to the credit of all these kind of like art housey horror films. I mean, <laughs> well, it's a sign. <laughs> it's oh, a whoa. sign. Did you hear that? It's a sign. Yeah. It's working. <laughs> when you get to the final act, they always just like crank up to 11 and just start to go. Right, right. Yeah, it's the same way in Hereditary. Mm-hmm. Hereditary is a build up and then just, yeah, boom. Uh, but we see this hand just come out of the hallway and drag him away. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> it's a very effective shot. Yeah. And and you realize, oh, shit. Like, and all these various demons and tortured souls start appearing and coming out and grabbing at her. And they cut her finger off at one point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A strange makeup choice on that. I really... I looked for more information to try to see where this might have come from. I, if I'm honest, I didn't like their look at all. Yeah, and you you had said that when we watched it. It didn't bother me. It seemed like the bargain bin like sci-fi channel feature zombie movie or something. I think that was intentional. Mm. It was kind of Mad Maxi too, and yeah. some of them like there was some latex face covering and stuff like that. It was strange. It didn't bother me. It didn't take me out of the movie personally. Right. It didn't me, but it. I I wish I knew more. Mm-hmm. Like, if for some reason, any reason, Liam Gavin ever decided to listen to this podcast, <laughs> <laughs> and I could Mr. ask Gavin, you, please write us. And I could ask you, like, where did the, the idea from this come from? Yeah, you know, I searched around and tried to see if I could dig up any like behind the scenes or production stuff, but I couldn't really find anything. There's a well, few things about it, but and we can talk about those, you know, briefly here in a minute. Well, but... it, it's better than the Sentinel. Have either of you ever seen the Sentinel? No, afraid not. I don't well, think so. Quickly, it's just about this woman who has to guard like this gateway to hell. And at one point, all these demons and, and damned souls start coming out and harassing her. And they had hired like people with actual disabilities and Ooh. things like that. Yikes. It's extremely. I mean, it was the seventies, yeah. but it's extremely exploitative. And yeah, well, probably not cool. On that. At least they didn't go that route. <laughs> I mean, these guys—they're not like Zombie Lake, like green face paint or anything. But they almost uh, look Aboriginal to me. Did you get? I don't know. Did anybody else get that? I didn't get that. Not they really. almost looked like Aboriginal or Native, like some like 
I think that's just your perspective. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's not I'm, because I'm not sure where that's coming from. I, and it wasn't because of like, you know, race or anything like <laughs> but that. I, think I don't know. For so much of the rest of the movie, they make the low budget work really well. And when there are these special effect moments, they're very subdued but very effective. But when this one happened, it kind of like pumped the brakes for me and I was like, mm. "Yeah, so she descends into hell, basically. Mm-hmm. The basement is hell." And that is where all these demons are and they sever her finger, but I always found this weird, but she like somehow manages just to push away from him after they've done that. I think she just summons the will to like resist them. Right. That's right. kind of how I took it. Like the same way she resisted her, in quotation marks, son. Right. Whatever Which spirit we're was speaking to her. Talking about demons, that's kind of the thing. It's like oh, your yeah. willpower versus theirs. Sure. And they'll try to trick you and they'll, mm-hmm. you know. And so she pushes her way up the stairs and she sees a, a really blinding light coming out of a room. Oh, you know, and notably, while she's down there too, those demons are torturing Solomon. Yes, yeah. yes. That's right, yeah. Uh, but he's still dead, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just they're mutilating his body yep. kind of a thing. And that could be like a um, representation of what's happening to his soul right now. Right. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, then she pushes her way up to the light, mm-hmm. essentially, and she opens this door. And this is where you got, this is where it, <laughs> for you, you were like, oh, no, like hard. They made a choice, and it's not a choice I... Don't know how well, I what, feel about it. What choice but did they make? What again, happens? for some reason, if anybody knows why, please <laughs> tell me. They chose to do an almost Michelangelo-style angel. Well, we should just set up the scene, right? She comes through this door, and she's back in the main central room of the house, the, right. the primary ritual site, and where it should be stands her guardian angel. Sure. And it's this giant size, crouching version of like a Roman centurion with the wings. Yeah, yeah. Probably, what, out. three times the size of a normal human, something mm-hmm. like that. And gold is raining down, right? Yep. Yes. Like at the time. And that's kind of mentioned a lot in... Um, As one of the signs. Yeah, that gold will be rained on you. And that that's also gets into some very paganistic stuff, too, like mm-hmm. with Pliny the Lesser and all that stuff about yeah. gold raining down. But they choose to do this weird thing where, like, the angel just barely speaks... Well, he, like, mouths, and we can't hear it, but I think it's implied that she can hear. And right. it's, and it's also, like, it's you're not supposed to hear it. Right. It's, it's how, the way I take it, and it's, like, it's almost so loud, and it can't be contained. But also, we didn't do the ritual. This is for her. Sure. You know? So, I mean, she basically says, what I ask is for the power to forgive. And... You thought she'd ask for vengeance, but mm. she's asked for the power to forgive. Right. Mm-hmm. And the angel smiles at this. Yeah. It's kind of a creepy smile, though. You know, like, it's, it's very... It's kind of a knowing... But also, I, I took it... Not, I didn't get a creepy vibe from it, personally. Uh, yeah. I, I took thought it, it as more like, of approval. Yeah, like, he, this was what he hoped would happen. Right. And, it, and this is a very Christian thing, too. I mean, the power of forgiveness. That is, that is like, the basic Christian right. tenet, you know? So, after she asks for this, basically, that... She leaves the house. Right. Everything's normal. Yeah. She's just in the house. And she leaves. The car starts. Mm-hmm. And she drives away, and she's just crying, mm-hmm. you know, on but the way. it's almost like a happy cry in a yeah. way. But she is missing the finger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it it's, really not, it's not like that was a hallucination. But what I really felt, and this is alluding to what I said earlier, that it was never about forgiving the killers, but it was about forgiving herself. Do you I think that was that. her? Do you think that was her intent from the beginning, or was it her ordeal that made her realize I, think it was I need her, to forgive? I think it was her ordeal because I think that we get so caught up sometimes in punishment mm-hmm. of what someone else has done, but that wasn't what she was so k- destroyed about. She was destroyed because she was supposed to protect her son, right? Mm-hmm. And she couldn't, and she didn't, and like, didn't he? Didn't the uh, demon boy even say like you were supposed to pick me up? Right. And it makes it sound like maybe she was late. The implication yeah. to me was like that she turned her back to do something, and then when she turned back around, the kid was gone. Right. But ultimately, the one that she needed to forgive the most so that she could survive and carry on with life was that she needed to figure out how to forgive herself. Mm-hmm. Right. And so my wife and I had this discussion on the way home from watching the movie, is that you know when we're discussing like the reality of it for her. And I think the point is that it doesn't matter if it was real. Mm-hmm. But her experience got what she needed. Right. Do you think it's real? Is it real enough for you? Right, right. And I got the feeling that if this didn't work, she was done. 
she was probably going to kill herself. And that is a lot of stuff to the occult in a way, because really it's more about like what you pull from it, I think, sure. than actually like influencing the world. You're not going to go out and sling a fireball. Right. But, you know, maybe from doing something, if it changes your mentality or gives you a sense of peace, did it work? Maybe it did. Right. It's, it's your will affecting change. Mm-hmm. That's right. the whole point. And that goes to the thing that I've said all the time about religion of any sort. If it makes you a better person, do it. Sure. I don't care. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I can get behind that. As long as you're not hurting anybody else. Right. Yeah. Like, if it makes if you it a work, better if person. If it works for you and doesn't hurt anyone, awesome. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of my whole philosophy with that that I've always said, and I think this really pushed that. Mm-hmm. Now, the only downside is that Solomon's dead, <laughs> um, because before she takes off in the car, she's actually wrapped him up mm-hmm. and uh, sinks him in, a, in, yeah. the, in the lake. In the there. lake. Yeah. <laughs> right behind it. So <laughs> you're like, okay, well. Someone... That's also a pretty paganistic ritual in and of itself. Like she didn't bury him or burn him. You know, she mm-hmm. puts him in the water and sets him off. Right. And then, but I also thought too, you know, it's not her fault that Solomon died. No. She might take that on herself because she pushed him. He went in the knife or whatever, but he was equally involved in this ritual as well. Sure. He knew that this could turn very badly. But I was, I was so relieved at when she says, I want the power to forgive. Because the whole time I'm watching this movie, especially with her son's voice appearing and things like that, I was. Have you guys ever seen the old TV horror movie Dead of Night from 1977? I've heard of it, but I've never seen it. Uh, directed by Dan Curtis, has three short stories. Uh, a couple of them were written by Richard Matheson. Cool. One of my favorite awesome. writers. Yeah. But his segment, uh, Bobby, is about this woman who resorts to black magic to revive her drowned son. Oh, interesting. Mm. And he comes back, but it's not really him. Sure. And I was a... afraid watching this movie, that's where they were going. Mm. And pet, I would have, I would have been thing. so disappointed if that's <laughs> what it was. Yeah, yeah, that would have really, that would have killed it. Yeah. That would have been a super downer. Uh, but the fact that, yeah, she's, she's asked for forgiveness, it's so, it's it's neat. It's cool. It's so, like, mag- magically ritual and Christian, and it's, 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 it's unique. Yeah. It's, I, I was not expecting that. Thought of and I think the beautiful thing is that they don't linger. The movie's just over now. Right. Right. Like, they don't linger anymore on how she goes on with her life. We don't right. know any. You could have got, like, a montage of her doing stuff, but you don't want to see that. Yeah. Really. No, we don't. And we don't know anything else. Mm-hmm. This, this, that's it. Yep. You know, we've, we've reached the end of her journey now. So, so um, let me talk about that angel scene. Yeah. Real okay. Quick. Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe it was just because I was still reeling from the demons and being like, mm, I don't know. When she comes through that door and then it is just the Michelangelo painting kind of thing, I was just kind of like, you know, that's it. Sure. You have all this stuff about the occult and magic and everything that's going on, and you could have done anything to depict an angel. And, you know, even in the Bible, there's these crazy depictions of them where they're just like, you know, floating <laughs> wheels with eyes in them and yeah. wings everywhere. They have four heads right. and four feather wings and things like that. Yeah. And then it just seemed like, oh, you did the blandest way you could depict one. Well, I think they really just wanted to get across to the audience that this is actually an angel. You know, it's your typical, stereotypical angel representation, and I think that's why they went with it. So you wouldn't question it. You wouldn't think, oh, that's actually a demon. Well, now let me answer my own criticism, and I think Mm -hmm. you mentioned this, Michael, right after we watched it, but maybe it is that way because that is her interpretation of what an angel should look like. Yeah, that's a good point. That's Mm -hmm. what I felt that, and I didn't pick that up the first time. You Mm -hmm. see what you expect. I got that the second time, I think, that we always wonder, like, you know, we're looking for the patterns, Mm -hmm. and that's that's the pattern that she found. You know, that was what she knew as what an angel would look like. Right, right. And for her, what the demon looked like was her son, in a way that wasn't her son. You know, like that was the voice of the demon. Right. That's the best way for a demon to torment her. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think everything was kind of catered to her. You know, that's how the demon chose to reveal itself to her, and that's how her angel chose to reveal itself to her. Hmm. But these are all interpretations, you yeah. know, of the film. I think this is. I think this movie is very open to everyone's interpretation. Sure. Um, for me, I thought this movie was quite powerful in a sense of what, I, like, the first time I watched it, I was going through some rough shit, and I found what I needed in the film. That's awesome. Hmm. And so I think that this kind of brings us to a brief conversation or a brief topic of sometimes what film can do for us, mm. you know, that we right. forget that it's art, mm. and that we always talk about, what a, what can a song make you feel? You know, people right, can right. really relate to that. Or if you look at a painting, what does that make you feel? 
But we forget sometimes that film is that way too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, good movies should make an impression. Right, they should affect you in some way. And a lot of the shit that we deal with, and a lot of the shit that we watch. It's usually like, okay, well, I don't know. It's if that's disposable. It. It's disposable yeah. entertainment. What did Jason Voorhees make you feel? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't always get that. And we don't always, even though that is art, that is very much someone's art. Sure. Right? You it's, can appreciate the special effects. Right. You know. But right. this is one of those things that's really heavily designed to As make message, you feel something. It means something. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, you know, that was kind of one of my reasons for picking this film is that some of my favorite genre films are ones that really make me feel something. Mm-hmm. Ones That's that, why I love this subtype of cinema. Yeah. Like, I, what did I call it in the intro episode? Like, emotional horror. Yeah, emotional <laughs> trauma. Yeah, emotional trauma. Um, but even though this movie is a little traumatizing to some things because it triggered me on some... I shouldn't say they were triggered. But it hit me on some levels that I'm insecure with. Mm-hmm. I still felt really good after it. You yeah. know? I felt like... Mm-hmm. I got a good answer for myself. <laughs> right. So with that being said, um, what did you guys think of the film? Um, like, as you said, I, I told you about it initially, and I I liked it a lot. I was very impressed the first time I saw it, and the second watch through, I was able to look at more details. Right. I knew what was happening, and it held up. Yeah. It held up. Um, I did read, and I'm so glad they didn't do this. But I read that the original cut of this was two hours and 20 minutes. Woo. That would have been too much. Yeah. This is lean, though, like as a film. What's the runtime? It's like 140, something like that. Okay, yeah. But I, I, I can't imagine. If there was an extra hour on there, oh, I'm so glad. You'd feel like that. you're going through the ritual, too, and yeah, like, is this right. part of the torture? I, I, I don't know what was cut. It would be amazing to see what was cut. But I think it was a very smart move to cut that part out. I think it's exactly where it needs to be. Even as it is, there were a few points where I was like, is this a little too long? I don't know, but it's okay in the end. Yeah, you probably could have cut off 10 minutes. But if they had gone further, I think it would really hit you at that point. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Having said that, and I think that's also a testament to the director's vision and, and skill. Sure. That he knows to cut this. You know what's the saying? Kill your darlings. You know, even mm-hmm. if you love the scene, if it doesn't work, you've got to get rid of it. Right, right. Um, and if you don't, it shows. Right, right. Um, and if for, for being a first feature, I think it's it's amazing. I can't wait to see what he does next. Yeah, he, he direct, didn't he direct some episodes of Bly Manor, Haunting of Bly Manor? On yes, Netflix? yes, he did. Yes, yeah. still need to get to that. That's good. Um, but so, I, I would giving it a rating. I would probably give it. I'd give it four stars. Okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. The n- the never five star man. <laughs> yeah, I think four stars is good. Okay, that's fair. Cool, Dustin. I had one question for you guys. Um, thinking about this film and the rituals and stuff. Effectively, she fails the ritual, right? You would think so, yeah, because she broke the. Her seal. intent is never clear until that final moment. She lies every single time. She breaks the circle. I don't know if you guys had any thoughts about that. It was something I kind of got hung up on a little bit as I was thinking about it afterwards. I almost, you know, if I think about it right now, I almost wonder if the ritual worked because there was a sacrifice made. Mm-hmm. Like if the sacrifice superseded the ritual itself, and that sacrifice was Solomon. Yeah, mm-hmm. or, or or if her suffering and her willpower was strong enough. Right. It all, it but happen. that could almost make you wonder if one's own willpower is strong enough, do you need to do the ritual? Right. The ritual is just a process maybe to enact that will. Right, but if you... If she the were, will made manifest. Mm-hmm. If she finally got to the right mindset and the right place that mm-hmm. she could find what she needed, then she got it. Okay. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Yeah, huh? I had that thought. So as far as how I feel, I had a lot of problems effect-wise. You know, those demons, the angel, I'm still hung up on that. I get the idea that it could just be her interpretation, and that's right. cool. I can I can jive with that. Uh, I think that's just my ploy to try to get you to like it. <laughs> oh, no, no. I think that's a very good idea, because if you go with this idea of magical thinking, that sinks right up to it. Right. Um, some of the backstory for me was a little weak, like this idea that like her kid was abducted and sacrificed in an occult ritual. It left me with a weird feeling. Cause it's like out of the gate, she's into magic. She meets Solomon. He's way into magic. Her kid died. How'd her kid die? Oh, it was kids playing with magic. It's like, is this like the Harry Potter universe or something? Right, like right. Every, everything is magic <laughs> and it's just accepted and true and real. <laughs> and for that point, I just kept going back to that and I was like, I... I don't know. Couldn't it have just been like her kid got hit by a car? And yeah, it that, still... that would be your typical expected reason. He's, but the such, fact... a, he's such a muggle. 
<laughs> He's such a muggle. And, and the fact that it was magic, like I said before, that stuck in my crawl. I was like, okay, was she already into this? Was this yeah, people she yeah. knew? That you know? being said, if I had rated this maybe right off of watching it while I was still kind of pissed off about that, it probably would have been lower. <laughs> I was so worried because I looked at your face and I was like, yeah. oh, no, he hated it. <laughs> but as I've sat with this and I've really thought about it more and more, and I love that theming of like going through this ritual and what you get out of it and you know manifesting your will upon the world. And what you've said that in the end, it's really ultimately just about, you know, forgiveness and finding that power to like forgive yourself for your failings yeah, and coming to terms with that. So really, even though I have these hangups, I don't think they're anything that can like weigh down the movie in a way that like harms it. Mm -hmm. So I would probably go four stars on it. All right. Oh, yeah. I've really like turned the nice. corner on it. Whoa. I wasn't yeah. expecting well, that. What was your initial reaction? You think how many stars would you have given it right after watching it? Right off the top, probably like two and a half. Wow. Ooh, ouch. But wow. really, I've kept going back and thinking about this again and again, especially as I researched and was like digging up stuff about the ritual itself. And I, I guess I respect the level of detail and quality they put into presenting it. Sure. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that I I would love to still talk about this movie. Like we can't because we're time. We're already way over time anyway. But I would love to still talk about this. Right. But it, there's so much like just even if you don't love it quite as much as any of us have, like there's enough here you can talk about it and really think and have and a conversation. It, and it's a low budget movie with basically two people. Yeah, and that's what can be done with it's, good writing. It's beautiful and good when acting yeah when good talent. stories are told. Yeah. But I'm sold, man. Like whatever he does next, it's a ticket for me. Yeah, automatically. Awesome. awesome. Well, obviously I'm five. I'm right. straight wow. five on this one. Wow. This movie has sat with me for two years, and I think about it, and I talk about it all the time. That's true. Anyone who will... I mean, you guys know, because I feel like almost every fucking time we sit down to watch a movie, I'm like, <laughs> did you guys ever watch Dark Song yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> did you watch Dark... Oh, my... Dark Song just makes me feel so much. You gotta much. watch Dark Song. <laughs> and, and I could tell that you're like, just fucking show it for the film <laughs> club then, man. <laughs> <laughs> so this movie's always a five for me. Awesome. Just, um... Movies that impact me like that are always going to stick with me. So I know there's a blue out there. If someone wants to stream this, is it streaming anywhere? Or It used to be on Netflix, but it's not anymore. We uh, had to rent this through Amazon, I yeah, believe. we rented it on Amazon. Yes. It was a few bucks, though, right? Not too bad. Yeah, it was like three yeah. or four bucks. And Definitely worth it. Worth rental. it, totally. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I'd pay for this one. Oh, and wow. I did. I Venmoed your wife the cash before <laughs> you rented it. So I paid for this one. Thank you very much. Well done. Okay, so if you guys watch this movie and you love it or hate it and you want to discuss more about it, there's a lot of fun little things about um, behind-the-scenes stuff that we just really didn't get a chance to get into in this because we got so wrapped up in talking yeah. about the emotional and spiritual side of this film. I had to rant about the occult. It's it's good. But I totally <laughs> dug it. I was, I'm all in. So if you guys like this and you want to talk about this more, join us on any of your favorite social platforms, whether it's if you just want to go the old school way and email us, shoot, one of us will write you back. All three of us will write you back. You'll get tired of us. Yeah, genreexposure <laughs> at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Yeah, hit us up. Let's talk about this movie. Let's just continue to engage in film. And, and if just... you know any other cool occult films like this, let us know. Oh, yes, yeah. Please, if we eventually get some requests coming in, I want to make a cycle where in this rotation of our picks, we start to filter in picks from like fans and stuff. Yeah, that'd yeah. be fun. I like that. Absolutely. So what do we got on the docket next time? Oh, it's my pick, isn't it? Yes, yes it is. Oh, right, right. Let's see. Hmm. What should it be? What should it be? I think we haven't done found footage yet. Love have, found footage. We have not. So we're going to watch a little movie called The Poughkeepsie Tapes. See, I pronounced it wrong the first time. It's like you pronounce the pooch keepsy. <laughs> the pooch keepsy. That's a different movie. <laughs> There's a lot of interesting stuff we can talk about this one. I've not seen it, but it's got a bit of a uh, urban legend kind of quality to it. Yeah, I think uh, I hope maybe you'll enjoy it. Yeah, we'll see. We'll find out. All right, we'll All check right. it out. Until next time, thank you guys so much for joining us at always, and we will see you next time. Bye, everybody. Take care.